Welcome to the Stand on Your Investment podcast, presented by UC Hunting Properties and Expedition Land Management, where professionals from around the country will dive deep into land management strategies, investing in recreational real estate, and all things hunting. All right, we're back. Another episode of Stand on Your Investment. Uh, super excited today. Uh, as always, Chris Van Gerpen, Travis Homley joining me. Uh, and today, our special guest, and, and I'm, I'm going to flip, normally I call Northeast Iowa God's country for obvious reasons, uh, but they may even trump us. They, uh, we are joined by Nate and Ryan Ammons in Elbia, Iowa. Um, these guys are Hawkeye Farm Management and Real Estate down here. And I say LBI, Iowa, because I think it's probably the most famed town in Iowa, if you're talking about big deer. Monroe County, LBI, Iowa, we're very fortunate to have some of the best stuff around. And uh, the whole area across, you know, these two southern two tier counties is good. But, uh, you know, the world record being shot here several years ago, back 2007 or so, um, you know, 2000, whatever year it was, it, it, it definitely had uh, a changed our uh landscape of what people saw um but it's always been good down here and we're fortunate to have a very good diverse uh landscape you know really good um row crop mixed in with some of the best timber and everything in between so um yeah we're we're definitely down in a good area i don't think anyone that hunts deer hasn't heard of lbi iowa that deer put you guys on the map for sure and and even before it got shot that was pretty cool that i think I don't even remember who had the video out if it was hs yeah primetime bucks maybe and and they had basically done a documentary on this deer's life Mm -hmm. in the background and then when it came to the forefront and and he ended up getting shot pretty neat that the love stone buck was that well documented but anyway enough about that um guys take a second give us a sneak peek into who you guys are how you got where you're at that sort of thing just uh, a quick background on you guys personally uh, well, I'm, the, <clears throat> I'm Ryan. Uh, I joined the business back in 2012, 2011. Nate, actually, he's the younger brother. Doesn't look it, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the jabs already started. I like it. He, he jumped in, um, into the business ahead of me. Um, I did, I had some military stuff and, uh, a few call or a few different college trips around, uh, and then made my way back into the office and just kind of jumped in and started with it. Nate's always been interested in all let him tell that himself but that's kind of just coming back to the office um never thought that was going to actually happen never thought that would actually be the path the path but uh i told you or i've said it you'd be crazy if i thought i was going to be working with my dad and my brother in the office as much as i loved him growing up uh it was uh just button heads all the time but no it's been it's been beneficial it's been great and it's been it's been amazing just the change coming in here and being able to do what we love yeah now we butt heads every day and we get paid for it most times so <laughs> that's even better, <laughs> even better. But, no i uh you know i left uh i'm nate ammons by the way and uh i went to school i originally was going to school um you know, you don't obviously have to have a real estate license to, uh, or uh, a degree to get a real estate license, but I, you know, wanted to get a degree and went to school. And I found out pretty quick that I had, you know, I like to have a lot of fun and the classes I went to, I did very well. And the ones I didn't go to, I didn't do very well. So anyway, I uh, came back home and I was working and, and uh, going to a community college and dad was like, you know, why are you still messing around with this? And, uh, at this time it was actually work. I would go to work instead of class. And so, um, dad's like, you know, you got to just get your license. And I said, well, I'm going to get my degree and then come in there. But finally I said, you know what, it's time for me to do it. I was working in here already and involved. And he was kind of in a transition plan getting out. And, uh, I was, had wanted to get involved in it. You know, uh, I always enjoyed the opportunity, the outdoors and, uh, saw the, the ability that, you know, he had with the business and, and, uh, whatnot. And, So anyway, uh, so I ended up joining, I've been at it 13 years. I think I started in here in 2010 or so I was working in here and then got my license in 2010, I think, um, helping with farm management originally. Um, and I want to say I was in my early twenties or so. Um, so anyway, that was kind of the transition plan, but, the the thing that changed that we didn't expect was I kind of started to grow my own business. And so then dad's transition plan out of here became, well, we've got this going this direction and he's still going this way. So I said, well, Ryan needs to get in here because Ryan was, Ryan was actually going to school and getting his degree and, and it actually happened. And uh, so anyway, Ryan, I was like, you know, 
is there any chance of getting you in here? And he was not very interested. And I don't think he was – He for the same reason he said is he said, I feel like we're just going to come in there and, and it's nobody's going to get along. And not that – you know how brothers and dads yeah. and everybody oh, – yeah. you know, when you work together, it can be a unique dynamic. Um, we've been very, very blessed and fortunate that it's worked out great. And, and I think some of our differences become our strengths because we're able to each play off each other. And also we're not afraid to say, hey, I don't like that. You know, and sometimes butting heads and being able to walk away afterwards is important. So anyway – and that's the – he asked about that stuff, and I graduated school. I got done with school, got a business management degree, and then I started going to work. I was sitting there working in an office. I was doing safety inspection stuff or quality. I don't even remember. That lasted about three months because I hated it. I, I mean, data entry, all that stuff. I, I've always messed around with computers growing up, but that was not that, – that was not for me. Um, and I started coming into the office, helping them out with um, – helping them out with some marketing side of things, helping them out with some some of the digital side of stuff. Uh, the little bit of technology expert that I have on that. Um, and then it just made sense, like Nate said, finally to just go ahead and actually get my license and come in the office and start working. And that's where we thought that was, again, the transition point for dad. But it, again, did the exact same thing that Nate happened. I started to get my own clients. Dad still had his people. So it wasn't really, uh, really wasn't really transition because, like I said, we're talking transition and dad at 10 and not saying transition and dad out, but, mm-hmm. you know, we were talking about it in 10, then we were talking about it at 12. Here we are in 2023. 20, and, you know, dad's still in here as much as he wants to be in, in, in killing things in here as well. I um, think that the thing of it is it lit a fire in him also getting excited to be like, wow, this is fun again. I don't have to take the day-to-day, um, you know, fighting the, the business model and running things. And then also everything in between. I can work the things I enjoy, which is probably the best part of this business is when you can get to a point where you can enjoy the things you enjoy and then, you know, work through the process as you want to. Um, and I think so it lit a fire in him. And um, he's still, you know, I mean, he's also the type that's not going to retire and just go sit, uh, play golf or do that kind of thing. He likes to be in here cutting deals and stuff. So he got out of the Navy. He did 28 years, four active and uh, 24 reserve uh, in wow. the Navy. And the only reason he got out of the Navy is because they forced him out. <laughs> he, turned, <laughs> he turned 60 and they said, see you later. Uh, otherwise, he'd, he'd still be in right now if yeah. he had the choice. So it's like you guys are living a, a true maverick top gun story down here in <laughs> Albia, right? Yeah, I got it. Um, thanks, number one, for just breaking that down because I, I think it is interesting to talk a little bit about, I mean, you guys clearly are local grown Iowa guys. This is your dirt. Your name is well known. Your dad's been in the business. You guys are transitioning or whatever we want to call into it. But I think the business has also transitioned and – that's one of the things, um, I mean, you, I, I think you guys as a, a firm or an agency are, are known well uh, because of some of the, the scope and scale you've brought to it. And, and I know you guys are both crazy humble, uh, but I'd be pretty remiss not to bring up the fact um, you guys run in that top 10 pack year in and year out, uh, which is not a small feat in United Country. That's a, that's a huge deal. Um, and as partners with us through the UC Hunting Properties, we're excited to have you. Give us just a little overview on on what the business does look like, the scope and scale for the listeners, so so they do understand. There's something to this thing having farm management in your name, you know, and in the scope and scale of of the business in general. Yeah, we've got, you know, when I came in the office, it was about four or five of us. We had a couple of part time agents. Um, we've grown since then. We're now at 11 agents and we do have a couple part-time still on that. But for the most part, we've got a lot of full-time agents that are doing stuff. It's not anything against part-time agents because believe me, there's, there's absolutely a need for some of that stuff. You just got to have the right job that goes along with it. Um, but being able to be full-time like that, that helps out just tremendously to give you, you're doing it day in, day out. Um, being able to do that has helped grow the business for that side. We go, what Nate, uh, about seven, across 17 different counties here in Southern this, Iowa. This last year, I think it was, you know, around 8,200 acres across 17 counties in Southern Iowa. Um, and a lot of that is again, as Ryan said, is building that bigger network is connecting people. And that's again, the United country method is, is there's 525 or plus, you know, offices nationwide. And we have access to all of those, um, assets throughout that. And it's just like our office the same way, um, is, you know, when somebody comes to one of my agents or comes to me, I may not have the answers, may not have the property, but guess what? I've got 
10 other people that I can look to and say, Hey, what can we do to make this happen? And that goes along with the farm management side of things as well, because what you look at there is somebody comes to me for one thing, you know, Hey, I want to understand how to do this and make my property more profitable. And I need somebody to help me in that situation. Um, I need somebody with boots on the ground because we are getting to a point also where the generations are further away from, you know, the actual family farm, or even the landowner is an absentee landowner because it's a really good asset, but they don't come here but twice a year. So who's going to take care of it and make sure it's taken care of well? You're going to hire a firm that maybe shows up and, and uh, you know, looks around on it, or you're going to have somebody that can look at it from the full scope and also look at the full potential of it, you know, and, and the biggest thing for us is with our specialty in having really good black dirt just north of us and some in our home county, don't get me wrong, but you don't have to go very far north and you're in some of the best dirt in the country. Um, and then you go south, you're in a little bit more rugged territory, but it's some of the best hunting. So all that combined makes for a lot of our territory in, you know, even into central Iowa, wherever, um, diverse. So that diversification, having people with different skills, um, it kind of relates to our farm management because it may be a guy that comes here just saying, Hey, corn and bean rotation is, is, is special to me. Or, you know, you throw in the cattle, um, operation, which is, you know, through the heart of this is, is cattle country. Um, and that whole thing kind of being able to tie together and then not along, along with that, Ryan is, um, the one that does a majority of, you know, a lot of book work with our, with our office staff. Um, we've got incredible office staff, um, but there's a lot of book work, a lot of, um, payments that come in from, you know, FSA or go out to, you know, come in from tenants. So there's a big scope of things that we have the asset to tie all of it together. And again, one of those things, you know, going back to, we've got agents, not that age really matters that much, but we have people from, you know, in their early twenties to my dad now at 75. So there's a lot of knowledge in between there, um, to, to look at, you know, especially as a market transitions, like it is right now, we can look back and say what worked and what didn't work, what um, what has stood the test of time. So anyway, I didn't mean to get long winded on that, but no, I'm I'm, I'm actually glad you did um, because I think it's things we look over being in the business that I think maybe the general public and maybe even some other agents or whatever that are listening maybe don't really understand that model. And, and, and it's something I picked up on immediately meeting you guys. One of the first things I noticed was the name. It is Hawkeye Farm Management and Real Estate. And, and that farm management piece plays right into what we're living and seeing, I would say, across the Midwest. And, and anywhere they're growing corn and cattle, this generational farm thing is happening. Mm -hmm. Now, we like to put a hunting spin on it for, for purely selfish reasons because we're all tore up yeah. with it. But the reality is when you're buying a farm, I don't care if it's up by us or over in Wisconsin with Travis and his team, um, the reality is that's a large asset and there's more to it than just hunting. Yeah. That might be the, the fringe benefit we all enjoy, but the reality is to own a 200 acre farm that's diverse yeah. and, and whether it's row crop, CRP, forestry programs, you know, a cattle operation, maybe there's more to that than what meets the eye. Um, and I know you guys can zip right through it and the, the farm management thing's kind of a soup to nuts thing, but Nate, you shared a document with me and I don't, maybe you even put it together, Ryan, I'm not sure. But, um, when I started looking at that and realizing you guys are, are literally stepping in, uh, almost like at a power of attorney level and you're signing the, the FSA paperwork, you're, you're negotiating rent deals. Um, so I don't want to just gleam over that yeah. because I think that's a huge deal on, if a landowner's absentee or it's maybe it's a trust situation, the farm's got put into a, a family trust and there's three kids involved or 20 kids involved or who knows. Yeah. Uh, and you guys become that conduit to managing that farm and helping them, you know, keep a generational farm together. And at the end of the day, making these people some money. Um, so on that note, uh, I was kind of setting the stage because the next question I was going to ask you and, and this playing it to both of you, um, give, Give the listeners just a, I'm calling it a success story, but I'd love to hear a story almost start to finish on one of these deals you guys have worked together that's long-term, successful, win-win outcomes, uh, just so people can truly understand a soup-to-nuts farm management approach to real estate. Um, and I bring this up because we're in the land management business, and I think people blur those lines. Yeah. And although some of that comes together, 
um, to me, the farm management is the, the top of the heap. Who is making the calls on what land management techniques need to be worked into it? So sorry for the long no, intro that's... leading up to this, but I would like to hear or have you guys explain one of the success stories you've had. And, and I know they're happening as we're talking, yeah. literally, but walk us through one of them. Um, I'd say probably one of the, the ones for me on my side of things for the long-term management side of the stuff was we've been working with a family for quite some time in Mahaska County. Uh, this was before I even started in the office. Dad started the thing uh, back when he came and started the office in eight, 1989 is when he kind of jumped in and started working with this family. Uh, and at that point, it was – sorry, there's three – There's three. there used to be three owners. That's what it started with. And then it went to – well, one side had uh, – then it went to a couple uncles. Then it went to – finally, when I'm involved in it, there's seven kids on one side. There's a 50% owner on the other side, and that, I mean, that's the quickest and easiest way to go about it. Ryan, to, to frame this up maybe even a little further, because it's already getting complex, right? That's a <laughs> lot of yes. people and opinions and, and emotions, obviously. Um, scope and scale of this farm, I mean, are we talking about 200 acres of dirt, or are we talking about 2,000? We're talking, it, it's about 400 acres of highly tillable, high, high quality river bottom. There's some river bottom in it. It's, I mean, in, in Iowa, I think the lowest, the lowest farm, the lowest CSR on that farm was 65, and there was some wow. stuff that was 80 CSR, uh, good solid 80 CSR dirt on that thing. Um, the kind and, of ground probably averaged 10,000 across the board at the time it did, and it's, um, you know, well, actually probably better than that because we sold some higher than that, but anyway. It, it, and that's what, it, it's just going through that process of working with that many people. We're, we're working with the FSA on that side of thing, making sure everything's in, getting certified, renegotiating with the tenant. Um, and I guess the reason I brought that up is just it started here with just a couple people. That's what some people don't think and some people don't realize. It starts with just a couple people handling this thing. Well, then the farm goes into a trust, and then there's 15 different, you know, like I said, it goes for five owners, and then, you know, they pass away, then it goes to their kids. Well, then you've gone from five people to 25 people or five people to 15. Then you get that many people trying to make a decision. That's what we're involved in to try and give them the best expertise, the best ideas, and working with that stuff. So there's one point of contact. There's not all of those different ones trying to make decisions on stuff. Uh, and, and that led to down the road, like I said, it's not the goal of every single one of them. We want to work with these families and do as they see fit with the farm. Um, but one person asked about it, and we presented the plan and said, hey, this is what stuff's looking like. And just, you know, into last year, uh, we ended up selling that thing at auction. And like Nate said, I think it ended up averaging just over – 10,000 an acre on all those acres. And this goes back literally into the 80s. Like you said, your dad's been working with this family and it's transitioned to you guys. And obviously on the other end, on the on the seller's end, it's trans, transitioned multiple generations. Well, the cool part actually for the, for the sellers was the cool and a little bit, I mean, it's a little sad. They, their family got this when Iowa became a state. Wow. They, they, the, the abstract was transferred from the state of Iowa to them. Unbelievable. That's cool. That's but the, the positive thing about those kind of things is, like Ryan said, is connecting all those people and then having one conduit to to figure out what's right and wrong. And the thing of it is, like Ryan said, is not everybody had the right answer for, because everybody had different opinions for what's best for the family. But the family makes the decisions, and we help them through the processes. And that's the important part is that we're, you know, there uh, – the farm management business, I can tell you, is it's not necessarily lucrative year in, year out. Um, it's, it's the relationships they're important and the trust that we build, uh, because there's attorneys involved and being a conduit to all those, um, that's the important part. And then sometimes they do sell like that one. Um, and that one was a, a very good success story. And that one was even unique because I mean, part of the farm laid out, it was a very diverse farm as we can get into, especially a river bottom farm. And we had to look at it from an aspect of what, you know, the families, you know, maybe saying what's the easiest and you know, what's the best opportunity. And that would be auctioning. But there was also some pieces that had some difficult sales. So we took not only our auction background, but we also had to do some negotiating direct with some neighbors, which can sometimes be unique, especially when a parcel has poor access, it's landlocked or something. And we knew you take that to auction, they'll sit back there and buy it for nothing because of the access. But if we can go with them directly and have a honest, fair conversation with them, you know, and it turned out to be a great opportunity for everybody involved. And that was definitely a good, good deal. And it all led back to our farm management started, you know, years ago with, with dad's management business, with, um, his partner, Lyle Seifring with, uh, out of Oskaloosa. Um, and Lyle's still a good friend of ours and, and, uh, and, and very active and still in the, the land business, but he's like dad, he's working his way out and, uh, but still very active. 
Um, and then for me, you know, one of the things I think of is I just recently, Ryan and I just recently worked on a deal. Um, it, again, it's about connecting people. I had a client from out of the area coming to, uh, this area and he owns farms in probably six or seven States and he wanted kind of that ultimate farm in one, and that can be hard and had the ability to get into a sizable deal, but came here looking for maybe a smaller deal to dip his toes in Iowa, ended up in a very large, really, uh, expansive farm that's diverse with some of the best hunting in the country. Um, it's got row crop, it's got pasture, it's got hay, it's got buildings and it's got a home. So that's a really unique parcel. And he's coming here from out of the area with also owning ground in seven different States. So it's not necessarily a straight up management deal, but it's a deal that we get involved in after the fact to continue to say, how do we help you make this work long-term? And that's one of the biggest things people say, well, that's great. I'd love to own that farm, but what do I do with it? The extra things. So how do I, I take care of a house in the winter time. You know, there's, there's a lot of, who's stuff. going to take care of the other portions of the land that I'm not hunting or taking care of. Well, if you, if you look at it, it's, I mean, people take their investments and give it to a financial advisor. They advise them when to sell, when to do, you know, it's no different than what you guys are doing. You're just making it more enjoyable for them to own it. And with a lot of these families, they're probably holding on to it a lot longer than they initially would because they can't see eye to eye and who's going to do the work. This takes them out of the equation, takes kind of the, the bickering or whatever that you have in a family trust deal or something like that, give, you know, makes you guys kind of the, the shoulders of the operation to get them their returns and everything to you know, carry on that family tradition. Um, I mean, it's, you're more of an advisory. Yes. It, and per, that's, per, that's hitting nail on the head yeah. because it, it's, you're get you're like you said, the financial advisor is doing some of that stuff. And it's, I mean, the heck this thing's called the stand on your investment podcast. That's what you're doing is instead of handing it to a financial guy, you're handing it to somebody that's taking care of that and then putting the ground where you can actually go enjoy that piece of property. And not only that, that, that part where you said about advising, that's one of the biggest things that I enjoy about it is on a yearly basis, that new CRP rate comes out. There's plenty of other things that come out on a yearly basis, whether it's re 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 <laughs> renegotiating the rent mm -hmm. or looking at that CRP rate that all of a sudden we got to go have that difficult conversation with a tenant because, hey, CRP jumped up and we need to be paying. We need to be working for our management client and getting that property in because, hey, all of a sudden it's $100 an acre higher than what the cash rent is. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that, that's a huge deal. The... I guess in summary and not, not to like just put a, a break on that story. I love hearing those kind of stories. And, and I think we're all living them or seeing them in, in different areas. The cool thing to me is you guys have become the subject matter expert for all things land. It's not just buying and selling real estate. You know, you are advising, you're the subject matter expert. And these families are putting a lot of faith in you guys to help them make good decisions. And I just think it's the coolest model going, I personally. So you guys even have it in your name. Obviously, that is where you are vested. Um, heck, it's before real estate, you know, well, so. And financial advisors are great. Don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a place for them. But financial advisors are looking, majority are books. Like, hey, where's your 401k going? Where are those things going outside of land? And land, as you guys very well put, is way more complicated and has way more things than just the stock market. Yeah. So anytime you can have those value-added services with, with what you do and being e experts in that, I mean, people, just you just make it so much easier. Somebody else can handle their 401K, that's fine. Yep. But when it comes to dirt and land – that's where they come to you because there are so many different things. Yeah. Our goal is to be an asset, you know, to look at everything for them and then say, you know, hey, this is really a good place for this thing, but I really would like to have, you know, you can go out and enjoy it as well as get the income off of every little thing. And it doesn't necessarily mean looking at everything and saying, we got to have the top this, the top that, top that, but it's looking at it as a whole and saying, what's best. We can have these several things and what is the best, you know, can we develop the farm and 
what does the long-term situation look Absolutely. like? Absolutely. That's the big thing we like to look at too, is that we will do our projections. And also we're always going to look at, you know, maybe this is a space for, you know, looking at consolidating some properties in the future. Some families, you know, buy things as they can, but the goal is to have one big situation, big farm someday. Um, if it doesn't have, you know, I think I was, I was watching some stuff yesterday and the discussion was, you know, the emotion that gets there. Some people will buy properties that have zero emotion, but right here's where the emotion is. So you might look at, Hey, our long-term strategy is to buy some stuff outside of the area that is going to work on a dollars and cents, but we're not going to fall in love with too much. Now, granted, I'm guilty of most of these deals. You're going <laughs> to yeah, fall in love with right. them. Yeah, that's, right. that's my yeah, biggest problem. Right. Uh, but, uh, but as we call it, you know, people become collectors, but there is also the asset we like to look at is, can we buy here when the market allows us to there? Because we, if you try to buy everything in your backyard, you know, that can be very difficult, but we look at it from a strategy with our clients is we're not married to one way of doing it. Let's look at different strategies. And, and sometimes it's thinking outside the box. Like I said, buy a farm in this county, in this county, knowing that eventually they're going to get traded into this county when the market works. Um, or if that asset changes, there's an opportunity to do something different or develop it or, or um, you know, and I, when I say develop it, I don't mean development property. I mean, like, can we improve the property and make it better over time? And then eventually it's going to be worth more. And with the appreciation, then we put it into something when the thing next door comes up. Anyway, that's kind of another so, model. So you, you bring up, a, a, you know, you do projections and everything. And, uh, you know, just that little storyline that you put together. I'm, I'm a person coming from outside the state, want to buy some row crop ground with some hunting and in Iowa your projections that you run basically when you sit down with that client and I mean you can run it through what what do you do for me to help me manage my farm with me being a absentee absentee landowner but on the front side of things you guys run the projections on what this farm can yeah. do for you and how we can do it so I mean basically you give them a profit and loss up front yeah of this is going to be your projections if you buy this particular farm and if that meets their criteria with whatever percentage they're trying to gain off of it or recoup recoup some of the costs and then have a nice hunting farm all in the same yeah. thing i mean kind of break that down if travis homley comes into you know your office and says you know i i got x amount of money and i want to buy a farm down here what we're, I mean, what what do you do with that client to kind of break them down to find them the right farm and then get them into your management program? Well, one of the first things that we do, you know, and this would be whether you're getting into the management or whether you're just going to try to get into something that I hope to see, you know, you a year from now say, man, look at this big deer I killed. And, you know, whether it's that situation or management, whatever, a lot of the things that we like to look at is, uh, especially being locals to the area. And when I say local, I don't mean just, you know, I mean, I'm working across several different counties, but I've also got agents working other, uh, you know, we've got team members that are working in different counties and all that stuff comes together. So we're uh, just as much as you guys, if I've got somebody down in my area, that's up in Northwest Iowa um, or Northeast Iowa looking, uh, you know, for something uh, we can share that kind of connection. But I guess uh, one of the first things I look at is what are the goals and are, do we have realistic goals? And if if we, you know, how do we meet them? And being a local, a lot of things we look at is what is the long-term history of that property? What is the long-term history of that area? Um, is there any major things that have changed? And then what is the current use? Are we making best use of the property or the properties that are available? I should say, is, is the current owner making best use of it? Um, is there something that we think we can do more, you know, uh, unique we can throw in there or can we do something better? And it may not be us, but it, it can this owner, can we help them with the right people? That's the other thing, knowing the people. And again, a lot of it comes back to the network and connecting people. And that's what we're big into. I mean, there's agencies, uh, you know, across the country and I don't begrudge any of them, but there's, that may not have any tie to the area they're working. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you are skilled in what you're doing and you go find the right assets, but I think it's easy in today's market with, uh, the internet for people to claim to be a subject matter expert in a certain area, but they don't do the homework. Um, and I think what our goal is always to um, be the subject matter expert in the area we're in. And if we're not, 
who is that person and how do we find that? And so the, I'm going the long way around to answer your question, but my goal, my theory would be, is that the first thing we start with is getting to know their goals and then getting to know what opportunities do we have where, and then once we get to that point, then it's like, okay, where does that thing go from here? And I would tell you, it, it, people, I don't use it as a sales tip at all, but I tell people all the time, I don't care what you buy as long as you buy what's important to you and you like it. Now, I will try to guide you and give you the best information I can, but at the end, your gut tells you what you want to buy and you may fall in love with something and then call me later and say, I don't like it. And, you know, or I tell you, I think this is important, but it's not important to you. But my goal is to look at it from, you know, the dollars and cents of it, the future opportunity, and, uh, you know, how do we connect all of that and then keep an asset? Because not every farm is the same, you know, and that's so, you know, you can have 10, I mean, no farms the same. It's just every one of them has a unique characteristic about it. There can be a lot that look the same and seem the same, but especially in our area, um, you might have uh, all the pieces of the puzzle in one farm and then three of the pieces. How do we get to that, all the pieces? So I guess bringing it all together, connecting the dots is a big thing. And it sounds simple saying it that way, and, uh, but it's, it's, that's kind of what we look for. And it's the other part of that is being honest with them. I don't do any good blowing any smoke. It's the same thing I talk about with any of my clients, but I don't do any good blowing any smoke because all I do is set myself up for failure or an uncomfortable conversation that I got to have later on. I don't want to do that. I'd rather have it right there, get it out of the way. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of guys, well, I heard this farm's got 400 acre cash rent. And I'm like, yeah, that guy's going to be there for a year. Um, on the on hunting property, he's like, yeah, that guy's going to be there for a year. And then next year you're going to have the farm tore up I mean, just absolutely tore to heck, and then you're going to be looking for a new tenant. Realistic, anyways. too. It, exactly. Yeah. It's you got to be realistic about that stuff. If I got somebody coming in, I want a 5% return farm uh, that pays for itself. I'm like, I do, too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Grab a time yeah, machine. Let me know if you get a list of those. Yeah, yeah let's sign it up right now. Cause <laughs> well, and, and, and that's an interesting point, right? Because if you look at a trend line, the national average is about 6% return across the board after inflation. Land's going to do somewhere in that 6% range. I think we've obviously been living a massive spike the last couple of years, um, but reality is going to set in. So buying a farm that doesn't have revenue or you're not maximizing the revenue, uh, people could get sideways in a hurry. Yeah. And that's, you want to maximize the revenue, but to a point, um, you know, there could be somebody that goes in, hey, there's, you know, $40,000 worth of timber in there. That's awesome. But if you take that $40,000 of timber right now, out of that farm, the 3000 just an example, $3,000 an acre farm you just bought is now worth $2,500 an acre. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you cost yourself that much because you're trying to maximize revenue. It's, it's being selective on some of that stuff. Yes. And the, yep. the, like you said, the 6% return, you, it's not just going to be an annual return. That's what right. we yep. have to try and focus. And we try to, like I said, is yes, you're going to get your return every year, but then you need to look at the long-term return yep. of owning this farm, owning this piece of dirt and seeing what Iowa land's done over the last couple of years. And the other thing that's big into that too is that, you know, what's it worth to you to have a place to go enjoy and build memories with your family? And, you know, that's a huge part of it too. And and that's, and it's for sellers as well. The same thing, Travis's question was more geared from a buyer's perspective, perspective, but from a seller's perspective, you know, I'm going to find out as much as I can to be able to, uh, and, and also have the same, uh, perspective as a lot of people in the area to be able to share that with buyers. And if there are negative things or whatever, we have to have that conversation, but we can have it intelligently and say, how do we outweigh those? You know, what, you know, there's an issue with this or this neighborhood, uh, it seems like, you know, uh, the, the deer, we just haven't, we've got heat with the HD, you know, that kind of thing. Well, yeah, but that's, you know, a pocketed area. And also, you know, that area over the last 15, 20 years has been good and it's on the way back, you know, knowing those things, whether it's our own personal information that we know, or through our other agents, teammates, um, or just being involved in the communities and knowing what's going on is a huge thing. Uh, Nate, we try. I, I can't believe you. I mean, you brought that up. Are you saying if somebody buys a Monroe County Elbia farm, that there isn't just 200 inch deer everywhere. <laughs> I mean, really? No. Uh, behind every tree. Yeah, yeah. behind every yeah. tree. <laughs> and we have, to, it's surprising. We do. So, what we like to talk about in that whole situation is to say, we're not maybe going to find everything all at once, but we're going to recognize, we're going to put the odds in our favor and your favor. That is our best bet, is we're going to try to put the odds in your favor the best. Because if it was all easy and perfect, then we wouldn't have a job. But that, you know, because people could just say, oh, that's the best farm I'm going to go buy it, you know, but because you need to have uh, knowledge of the whole thing and then look at the perspective, 
behind it and after it, you know, what's, what's it like now, what's it going to be and what happened before. That's a huge deal in the land business. And people may not think about that. Maybe they do. Maybe I'm making something more complicated. That's very simple, but I don't know that people always think of the, having that history and, or the, the perspective in the future, looking into the future. Not that I have any we're, crystal we're, ball. We're going to shift gears. Cause I think everyone sitting at this table could get very long winded and this could turn into a three hour podcast, which <laughs> don't get me wrong. I'd love to do it if there was. Never mind. We won't go into the case of beer it's, on the it's table. It's no thing. drink January. Yeah, it is no drink January. And he's doing good. Ten days in, I haven't had the cold <laughs> sweats yet. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask, and, and I'm going to put you both kind of um, on the spot for this. If you had one tip you could give, and I don't care if you're playing on the buyer side or the seller side, on to help that person load the gun and what i mean by that and and the trav and i were just having a conversation you know if everybody whether you're a deer hunter or not had a catalog of trail camera pictures from your farm for the last 10 years when you go to market that farm boy what a story that tells right Mm -hmm. so that i'm stealing one that you're not going to be able to use but I, i think the use of of understanding value beyond what they see it you know they might call it a cattle farm we'd call it a hunting farm so a tip like that if there was one and again i don't care pick buyer seller side if there was one thing from from you nate and one thing from you ryan that you would say do this it will help you in the long run what is it so i don't care who goes first hire those guys call six four one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, one thing for me, I guess from a buyer's perspective, is be open-minded. Um, everybody in their brother, Monroe County, there's two highly sought-after areas to be in. Uh, and everybody's like, oh, I got to be there, I got to be there, I got to be there. You don't have to be there. It's just, it depends on, are you in it for, like you said, are you in it to go buy a piece of ground in Iowa, Monroe County, and like, all right, I'm going to go shoot that 200-inch buck, and then I'll see you later. Are you in it for the long term? Or are you in it for just, I'm going to go do that? Because if that's the case, yeah, we can be picky and we can go look at all that stuff. But for most people that I'm working with, they're looking for something that either it's a long-term farm that they're going to turn into an investment to flip into something else, or it's their long-term farm that they're hanging on to forever. And so you can create your own area. That's what those areas, I mean, the area southeast of town and the, the area west of town, that's what they did. They created those areas. That wasn't started like that. And so it's just a matter of becoming that way. It takes a lot of work. I'm not going to lie, but this business and owning land is not easy. And that's what I mean. You got to be in it for the long haul. You got to take a lot of work. You got to be willing to work with people. Um, and so that's what I mean of neighbors can create areas. You can go buy a piece here, then get a friend to go buy a piece right next door. You know, being able to do that stuff, just don't be picky, be a little bit less selective on that. Uh, because you can also get stuff bought a little bit cheaper <laughs> when you're not looking in those areas. Right. Well, and, right. And, and I think that's something that's, I mean, truly just being open-minded and how you're going to go into it. Cause you're right. You can dive into a ton of work, but there aren't, there isn't a farm down here that they're not starting in the good category. Correct. Doesn't exist. Right. But to get it to the great category, you might have to get yeah. your hands dirty. And it's more rewarding and too. You, and you Absolutely. can, it is, you can enjoy the process. That's the thing that I think is part of that is enjoy the process while you're doing it. Because I mean, it is, some people do enjoy the proper opportunity to show up and I'm going to go do what I want to do and this and that. But you know, there's a lot to land and the people that truly love land recognize that there's a lot to the process that is so important and so much fun. It's absolutely awesome. Great answer, by the way. Yep. So you're setting your brother up for failure. Cause I loved your, no, answer, that's good. All right, Nate, your turn. You know, my, it's not a very good one, but it's, it's, I think what I would say to a buyer or seller, um, be honest with yourself and have realistic goals. It's kind of like Ryan's, but be honest with yourself. Uh, if you come here, you know, looking for, uh, the, just mega deer, mega deer, you're probably going to be sadly, you're, you're going to set yourself up for failure because it's not as easy. And anybody that's been in these areas or in anywhere hunted knows that. But if you say, you know what, I want that opportunity to have, um, some really good hunts and some good income and some amazing memories, you know, we can settle in between. The other thing of it is these properties are what you make of them. Um, you know, you can take something just like Ryan said and make it a whole lot different. And maybe you'll never be on the cusp of killing that giant deer, but you, 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 uh, throughout the whole area down here is, is some of the best corn and soybean, some of the best cattle country and some of the best hunting. So you've got a lot of land to pick from and there's, it's all highly sought after. It's all very, um, mineral rich. 
Um, so you're going to be getting into a good asset regardless. Just set your goals realistically and say, hey, can I settle for this? Because this is, you know, everybody wants this, but you know, are we going to all be able to go out and get that? And I, I don't know. I didn't probably say that very well. well no, but you're, and you're not seeing, you're not going to see the, the other part of being realistic about that is you're, you're not going to see stuff like you think, Oh, I went and planted this food plot. I didn't get a deer this year. Well, yeah, there's a whole lot more that goes into it. Just, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a, it's a long process. Don't expect, oh, I'm just going to go do this. I'm going to buy this Iowa farm. I'm going to put this, you know, food plot in over here, clear this area out, put, plant some switchgrass. I'm good. That's it. Year Poof, two, year two, two hundred. Yeah. Well, and the other thing about that is, honestly, if the people set their expectations, I don't know how many guys that have come here with one expectation of a giant deer, and they kill something that's not necessarily their giant, but it's their biggest buck yet, and they're ex it's the best part. It's so exciting. Or their kid kills their first deer. Those are the things that are important, and and I think that's what people got to remind themselves of. I got to have some. I got to be honest with myself and have realistic expectations because there's always opportunity for the upside. But let's look in the middle. Because also there's people that call me for five years and have never bought anything. Guess what the market did that whole time? Yep. They up, can't yeah. get in. And we look at, and, and we might've seen two or three farms they passed on. Somebody made a bunch of money or somebody's got out there building great memories on and killed some big deer. So I think that's the biggest thing because people can get so picky and, and it's not like, but I also think you need to be picky for yourself. I, I don't disagree that you need to be picky and be careful. But at the same time, if you've got good information, trust your gut and don't wait for a unicorn. You know, I just think that people can sometimes get uh, uh, either greedy and maybe not greed. It's just uh, they they overthink it. And it's it's a lot well, simpler. And, and let's be honest, 200 inch deer are unicorns. Yeah. Right. I mean, oh, it, absolutely. It, the, yeah. The, the area can produce them. We know that Iowa can produce them. But the reality is they're one in 10 million. Right. So uh, Perfect answer from both of you. I think you both have a uh, strong chance in politics if, if this real estate thing doesn't work out. But um, Stick with real estate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a better lifestyle. I was going to say, we're, little, we're probably a little too honest for politics. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I just thought the way you guys answered that. I was like, wow, did I just watch? Never mind. Um, all right, we're going to wrap this thing up. But before we wrap it up, I do want a quick season recap. I know you guys are both big hunters. Um Give us the give us the breakdown on how season went soup to nuts for you guys. I'm gonna have to let Nate take that. I had too many military things this year, and so that's the, the genuine part about our office is the three dad and I and Nate owning this thing. The three of us kind of we pick up the slack where some of us out. I had to spend a couple of weeks in Kosovo on some stuff that's and had right. to do a couple other things. So my deer hunting schedule that didn't get it, uh, I was out of the office too much. So I told the guys I'd cover so they could get out there and do something. Well, we appreciate your service because yeah. anything military service related is probably more important than deer hunting. But floor's yours now. Well, and I don't have anything exciting to share either. As I told you guys, I think we talked back in November uh, on and off. And, you know, most of what we ended up this year is we – Across the area, I'm not making excuses, but it seemed like we were down a little bit. Um, I don't know whether, you know, some of, on one particular farm in, in particular, you know, it seemed like uh, a lot of our deer we had high hopes for this year were not necessarily where they wanted, where we wanted them to be um, or made many, you know, gains. And, and so it was kind of unique from that standpoint, had some deer disappear. Um, and so we ended up, you know, going on doe patrol mostly. We said, hey, it's time to use this time as a good opportunity. I spent a lot of time uh, chasing does and had some buddies out shooting does and spending that time and also making a plan for next year. Cause I kind of chalked this up. If something good happens I, and I got a deer to chase, I'll chase it. We had one, but you know, it was kind of a unique season, um, this year and the weather really wasn't grand. And again, it sounds like excuses for me not have anything hanging, but I'm okay with that. I've said that for years that I, I have no problem, um, you know, enjoying the season. And honestly, um, my season is probably best spent, uh, you know, looking back at how did we get to where we're at and what I screwed this up. I didn't make this because again, as a part of the real estate thing, it's a process for me. I, I will, you know, I told somebody I was walking a farm with the other day is that if somebody wanted to hunt this stuff and I go shed hunt their stuff, I'll probably trade them because I have as much fun, you know, beating around in the timber, uh, uh, shed hunting or pretending to be a farmer and food plot That's hunting. Not a shed. That is dad's fine though. I will <laughs> I don't say even that. Know what this is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, know. I wish dinosaur. I could claim that one from years ago. That was one dad found, but I have about as much fun doing that. And then the whole process is more fun for me probably. Um, you know, I, and also I was working on a property on one of our farms, developing some stuff and, uh, uh, putting up a building basically for us to have a place to play and have, you know, family and friends come enjoy it. So, 
Um, but anyway, that kind of stuff is about as important to me, the habitat work, learning every time I'm still, uh, you know, even though I'm involved in every day, I'm still trying to learn just like with guys like you, um, you know, and, and some of our other agents that we work with trying to learn more about how can we improve things. So anyway, that's my story probably from this season is, is I'm looking back to say, what do I need to do to be better next season and yeah. excited. And also we've got more deer shedding right now than we ever do. So I'm like, and the weather's been warm again. Um, it's, it's unique right now. It seems like that, that's co- been, that cold front, I think really put some stress on those. Deer, it hammered them. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it was cold. And that's, that's what I planned on getting out. Finally had time this late muzzleloader this after the new year, but after Nate here, Nate say I was too, I was afraid I was going to end up shooting a shed buck or something. That's <laughs> what I mean. I, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to take that. I mean, I know we need to kill some does on there and that's something we've had to do and get taken care of. But as soon as I heard about how many bucks were shedding, I was like, that's exactly what I'll end up doing. <laughs> so we I were figured seeing, to stay away. Seeing fields full of shed bucks and it was just kind of, um, and I think everybody across the area down here is seeing that. What's you guys is like up there? Are you seeing similarities? Or I, I'll let Gerps take this one, but I mean the the reality is we I think we'd all agree with your synopsis. Like this did seem to be an off year or 2022. Uh, we didn't see a lot of our headliners make big jumps either. So caveat to that, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it to Gerpsy quick. But the the interesting thing to me, and I'm just gonna go out on a limb and make a prediction. I think. That phenomenon now grouped with a lot of deer seemingly dropping their horns earlier than normal. I think a lot of deer this year just got a free year of growth and genetic potential. Because I think on a normal year in Iowa, when you're seeing those 20 to 40 inch jumps, there's a lot of four year olds that take a header. Yeah. Um, so yeah. now those those four year olds are going to be five year olds next year, and they'll have big jumps. They may pop sixty inches. We don't know, right? I mean, na- nature's a, a funny thing. But uh, Gerps, you're even more widespread on the land management side. I mean, you're you're looking at farms all over Hades all the time. Um, I I think it's it, these guys aren't alone. I mean, our, I mean, our area northeast Iowa is very similar. We just didn't have anything go boom yeah like we'd sit on a field and we same thing had some shed bucks this late season like oh boy you know we never touched a horn without or you know you go shoot when you're like hey, grab by the ears <laughs> <laughs> don't, <clears throat> don't don't touch a horn had one guy had one popped off went to load it in the truck and boom you know one comes off um you look over a field and be like man we got a lot of nice deer and then you're like, oh, yeah, they're nice, but we're not shooting them. Yeah, right. Um, and age-wise, uh, like they're old enough, but just nothing with that boom. Um, even we got down into Kansas. Um, Kansas didn't have anything take great leaps. They didn't have much water though this year. Oh, or did, do you that guys particular farm did? They were further. Oh, they're right on. Yeah, you're right we on were, water though. Yeah, yeah, when we weren't in that drought area, yeah. we yeah. were far enough in that north east corner that we didn't get that drought so we didn't have as much of that um we got out down all the way into oklahoma um had some really good jumps despite the dry weather i just don't think that dry came late i mean it came late enough that they were still able to get some stuff now i'm worried about oklahoma for next year because it was so dry i mean it goes looks like the dead sea in some areas you know so I don't know what that's – I think, like, my Iowa, Iowa Kansas, Midwest area I think is going to be good. I'm worried about Oklahoma. And as you get salt into those drought areas, what's going to happen for next year moving into – because now they have they had way more stress. So it'll be interesting. I mean, we had a good year late season in the Midwest. We shot our gold deer, you know, but those gold deer were not – you know, we were not talking that – Super top Booner, two hundred. Yeah. Like we weren't in that range, but some really solid, awesome deer. Just you know, very similar to you guys. Yeah, very, very similar. And anybody and they've into Wisconsin, it was the same thing. Like yeah. it just didn't seem like guys were getting those big jumps. Um, we well, I'd dope, like to think we were, we were running a, a a pretty tight click of some killers, right? I mean, mm-hmm. dudes that year in and year out are cranking not only their target deer, but it happens to be a big one, right? Yeah. Or, or big ones even. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I look back and I'm going like out of the 18 guys that I'm, I'm kind of fly by with the seat of my pants. We're constantly texting everyone, staying updated. What are you seeing? Um, 
off the top of my head, I can only rattle two of the, I'm saying 18, 20 guys yeah. uh, that crushed Giants. Um, and it'd be interesting to know what those deer would have been on what I would consider a normal year or a good year. Well, right? those, so, those 18, 20 guys, too, typically if they got them, they kill them. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so it, the fact of the matter is those two guys had them and they did do well. Um, but a lot of guys just didn't, you know, same boat as you and me and, and Kurt even just like, man, I just need to wait. Well, like I'm not. It's not there, there yet. There was a lot right on the bubble. Right well, and, and I think, you know, even on one of my farms that I own with a partner, one of my best friends is, you know, we saw a lot of the deer. And, and if it would have been one or two that didn't seem like they did anything, we would have probably, you know, went after a few a little harder. But it seemed like we were hearing across the area that there weren't. And we're like, well, maybe these deer just need, maybe this isn't the year. Just mm -hmm. like you said, maybe this is the year. Because it's like, well, maybe that deer's just not going to make that jump. But I'm like, maybe this is the year to give them a year off, you know, to, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Because it was like, if it would have been one that, that didn't do something, it's mm -hmm. different. But it seemed like across the area, something just seemed, you know. I mean, deer get hurt all the time. So there's always yeah, a deer right. like, yeah. wow, why didn't it do that? And yeah. then you're like, oh, he got a tine in the eye or he lost his eye or somebody shot him somewhere. And I mean, deer are hard on each other. Yeah, or he's just genetically not going to make that jump we hoped, you know. Right. But to have it across the board was – it made the Midwest – pretty interesting yeah. this year we mm -hmm. saw some good deer get killed but it was definitely fewer and far between than it normally mm -hmm. is well and we say it all the time the hardest part about killing a big deer is having a big deer yeah right, right. Yeah. so yeah. killing them is the fun part and, and i'm not going to say the easy part but uh you dang sure ain't going to kill one if you don't have it yeah. so uh want to say thank you anybody got anything in closing we're getting long-winded no it we're was good I appreciate you guys coming down and we, uh, we enjoy the partnership and definitely, uh, you know, we, we want to be an asset to, to people we work with and, and just, you know, it, it's, it's a good opportunity to bring like minds together. So I appreciate the chance to talk with you guys. And, uh, and likewise, we appreciate you guys opening up the office and, and taking some time to, to carve out this podcast with us. We're excited to have you guys on board and excited for the future. So I appreciate it. And if you're looking in Southern Iowa, these are your guys. These are your guys. To take care of everything. Soup to nuts, right here. Soup to nuts. And it As won't Kurt be a Heddy soup sandwich. sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, we're out of here. Thanks, guys. Thank you for watching this episode of the Stand on Your Investment podcast, presented by UC Hunting Properties and Expedition Land Management.